On behalf of the Raza Foundation, we welcome you all this morning to this new project that we are launching of art writing. Uh, Raza Foundation, as you are aware, perhaps, is founded and funded by the iconic Indian painter Sayyid Hara Raza, who gave all his money to this foundation and it's meant for others. He did not allow us to do anything for him until he was alive. Uh, publications that we had were all funded by his galleries, although they were funded in the name of Raza Foundation, but he didn't want a single pie of Raza Foundation to be spent on Raza. He also used to pay a rent to the Raza Foundation in the building in which he lived, which he had bought from his own money, but got it registered in the name of Raza Foundation. So he was, uh, and he was very deeply interested in, apart from visual arts, in music, poetry, dance, and ideas. So he left a huge legacy uh, in terms of ideas, inspiration, resources, whatever. And we have been trying to keep up that legacy alive, basically, by doing things for younger people. Uh, this workshop is part of a multi-arts, multi-venue Raza festival, which is going on, uh, which features visual arts, theatre, music, dance, poetry and ideas and cinema. So we have had an exhibition of Raza's own work around Gandhi called Gandhi in Raza which was part of the India art fair. We have two specially curated shows going on. Each year we are proposing to have a show <coughs> of young people curated by an artist and another show of young people curated by a curator. Oh please close this off, whatever it is. You know the word in Hindi for this is very interesting. Chal bola. <laughs> mobile. mobile. Chal bola. So uh, we have done uh, these two shows. One is uh, curated by Akhilesh, uh, who is here, and to whose show called Madhyama we will be taking you. You will be seeing it. The second show is at IFEX Gallery. This is at Triveni Sridharani Gallery. The other show is at IFEX Gallery, uh, curated by curator Arsha Lokhandwala, which is called Beyond Transnationalism. These are of uh, artist of South Asian origin, subcontinental origin, living in North America. You will be taken there also. Um, then we had in the, uh, in the Alliance Francis, a show of eight films done by a French director on eight models, which included Hussein, Raza, Ram Kumar, Akbar Padamsi, Jogin Chaudhari, uh, Krishna Reddy, K.G. Subramanyam, etc. Uh, and Rajin Dhawan, interestingly, but quite a sensitive film. Uh, we are having on 22nd, which is the birthday of Raza, a, a kind of a, a joint show called Yugma, which will have Raza and Ram Kumar showing together. They were great friends for many years, so we have a joint show. And this workshop is where we are at the moment. Uh, this we propose to, and then we have a poetry festival, a major Hindi poetry festival, something like 35, 40 poets and critics coming and taking over for two and a half days, more or less. So it's, a, it's, a, it's the idea that arts should be brought together and where we should de develop a kind of a rasikta which is not confined uh, to a single art, 
uh, people who are able to see art should also be able to enjoy music, should also be able to see dance, etc., etc. So that is the basic uh, thing we are trying to do. In this workshop, the idea <coughs> was that art criticism at the moment is confined more or less in the public space. Forget about the academic space, which is not so public and yet partly public, <coughs> to either galleries or so there when you write art criticism, since you are being paid by the gallery, you can't write anything which might not be favorable to the artist or the work of art and things that kind. Now, what does art criticism need? I'll give you my own example. You know, I'm basically a poet. <coughs> and I never thought that I will ever write art criticism or music criticism or, you know, criticism of the other genres. But it so happened that in Madhya Pradesh, where I worked for a large number of years, there's no body. So the newspapers will say, Ashok ji, aap hi likh dije. Oh, so there was something deeply unethical about it. <laughs> because I had the organizer. So I write about my own. <laughs> so, but there was no other way. And not only that, I should write in Hindi, which was the basic language there, but also in English. There was a couple of newspapers in English. So I started doing that. And I had no initiation into any of these, uh, whatever they are, uh, the, these arts. I knew something about poetry, but I, I didn't know. But then I thought the basic thing comes from a will to look, understand, appreciate, and analyze art, whatever that art be. So you have, should have a will to look and understand, and appreciate and analyze art. And secondly, you have to have a skill to write. You know, you might have a great desire to write. But writing is a specific skill. Uh, not everything, uh, everybody can write, you know. Uh, when you are writing art criticism, you have to be careful that it is both, and there is a dilemma there. Art is in an, another language, the visual language. And you are writing in verbal language. So there is a, a kind of a tension between the two. And Creativity must be uh, used as much as criticality to bridge the gap so that the art piece, <coughs> the art criticism is able to make the reader understand or feel or react or appreciate art better. There should be both humility and patience. You know, we are in great hurry these days. It's all these stupid technologies. Uh, we, we don't have time to uh, reflect and ponder and, and things of that kind. But art needs attention. They also add to your own attention. It, it brings art, every art brings to your attention what you might have missed or not noticed, although it is around you. Similarly, so you have to have both patience and humility. Humility because art is uh, something which has been done by somebody else and you are going to write about it. Now you should not write as if you are sitting on some kind of a judgment or some kind of a, that you are a magistrate or a judge or whatever. Then you should be aware of art critical traditions. There are many. Uh, it's not enough that uh, you pick up some information on Google or whatever it is, or from some odd books. You must be aware that there are concepts and strategies and uh, critical uh, ideas and, and theories which help you understand. But you should also have a desire to communicate or to convey the thrill the magic, the significance of art. You should decide who's going to be, I mean, you have to imagine an audience. 
Uh, if that audience is only academic, then that's one kind of art criticism, which can be very dense and um, you know very complex. But on the other hand, it could be uh, for ordinary people, uh, which have not necessarily been initiated into art, but which can understand, are willing, are vulnerable to understand. Then art exists in specifics. And criticism, unfortunately, deals in generalities. Now there is again a tension between the specifics and the generalities because you you have to say, oh, this is a trend, and this is this, and this is uh, this is new realistic, or this is realistic, or this is abstract. Uh, these are all generalizing terms. Uh, but when a maker of the art, the artist is not uh, necessarily subscribing to a theoretical uh, framework. Uh, he he. He does what he does by trying to uh, put across his understanding of the world, his understanding of what is around, 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 what is around. So you should be able to see that after reading the art criticism, the reader is able to reintegrate the artwork. You might have to analyze it. You know, so you have to sort of, in a manner of speaking, segregate. But it should be reintegrated. He should go back to the wholeness of the work of art rather than just analyze it. Then, awareness of other arts. That's what we are also trying to do in this. We are, we are trying to uh, have some talks on architecture, on music, on photography. Uh, you should be aware of uh, other other arts. They, uh, in any case, we keep on using terms which come from other arts. Rhythm is not a term of art, but we use it uh, and, and such other terms. So we keep on using other arts as metaphor. <coughs> um, there was a KG Subramanian show which is called Poetry of the Real. Now, poetry is not what uh, he is painting, but you describe it. So there is this nuance there that you use the other art as a metaphor. Then art takes place not in some kind of a vacuum. It takes place in the given world. And you must be aware of what is happening in that goddamn world. Uh, and Modi's are happening and uh, you know, all kinds of things are happening and people are running away with money and, and <laughs> all that and, and there are all kinds of rages taking place and women are being molested and there's a lot of uh, violence against uh, women, against the Dalits, against minorities etc. Now you can't uh, write as if all this is not there because art ultimately is taking place in the same world. So you must be aware of that. Secondly, somebody may have a global implication. Everybody thinks that he will have to Sarabhaum. So Sarabhaum is not a good thing. We don't do it in the same way. But the art is locally rooted. You use local material, local motives, local symbologies, local images, ideas, whatever. So the locality and the localness and the so-called universality in art merge. It, it, it emerges, the universality if any, will emerge from the rootedness, not from, from the location. It will not emerge as if descends from some global source. Now, ideas inspire artists. So artists are inspired by ideas like all of us, normal people. But art is not a translation of ideas. There is a famous episode, Malarme, who was a great uh, poet in France and also um, a great friend of many of the masters of that time, Picasso, Miro and whoever. And somebody came to Malarme and he said, Oh, I have all the ideas, Malarme, but I can't write a poem. So Malarme quietly said, My dear, poetry is made out of words, not out of ideas. 
so there is a distinction while you may be inspired by ideas and whatever so there is sometimes in art criticism an over reading uh, most of the times it is under reading <laughs> but sometimes you over read you see a politics which is perhaps not there you see a great idea being manifested which perhaps is not there etc but on the other hand arts also are a way of thinking they are not unthinking uh, genres artists also have ideas they don't necessarily uh, import ideas from elsewhere from philosophy from religion from political science or what you have so art also creates uh, its own ideas and you must be attentive to them then there is the famous intentional fallacy what is the artist trying to do now there is no way in which you can know this and sometimes the intention of the artist and the work of art can be quite apart a very famous example is paradise lost of milton he he writes within the poem to justify ways of god to man but it ends up by justifying ways of satan to god satan is a more powerful uh, character in that poem rather than god so this is this could not have been the intention of a very christian uh, poet uh, a great epic poet but the intention therefore intention is it what we literature call intentional fallacy what is the artist trying to do forget about that that is an unnecessary concern which will take you away from now another point is I had a teacher in my MA English in Delhi University. I uh, used to go from St Stephen's College. Uh, he was B Rajan and he used to say the job of criticism is to describe mostly and evaluate rarely. You must describe what is happening in a work of art as intelligently <coughs> as precisely as imaginatively as you can. expand the area of description and reduce the area of judgment or evaluation who are you to judge just because you are an art critic uh, just because you can write the poor uh, artist cannot write so he makes you he gets a hell of a hell no you are nobody to judge you must not this bible has said famously judge not for you should be judged तो फैसला मत दो क्योंकि तुम पर भी फैसला आयद होगा देन देर इज अ वास्ट क्रिटिकल थिंकिंग अबाउट आर्ट्स म्यूजिक थिएटर विजुअल आर्ट्स एंड डांस इन इंडिया अदर देन इन द मॉडर्न पीरियड इट इज नॉट एज इफ एवरीथिंग वी स्टार्टेड थिंकिंग अबाउट आर्ट्स स्टार्टेड जब अंग्रेज बहादुर हमारे यहां आया we were the original shastra makers so we have shastra of everything from natya shastra to kam shastra to tak shastra there is not an area of human endeavor or creativity which has been left out of the shastric tradition now we must be aware of it we are giving you in your rather heavy uh, uh, bag a book which has recently come out with our support called oxford readings in sources of no uh, oxford reading uh, sources of indian art edited by professor bhuyan goswami in fact we had called him but he not able to make it because of the uh, preoccupation so we are giving you a copy each of that which will tell you how uh, in india for thousands of years things have been written about the act of art making and this is only confined to visual arts and visual arts area was not confined to music sculpture ceramics etc it included all kinds of embroidery and this that and the other all everything was considered to be art that way so we should be aware of that also artists have written very intelligently about art i mean there have been artists who write about art uh, who are able, in fact two of the people who are missing one because he found delhi cold uh, intolerable and the other 
uh, who who had loose motions in the morning. Belly so, belly. Yes, yeah. Sometimes we will get them. Perhaps Krishan Khanna will bring anyway. Both of them have written, and Gulam Sheikh uh, has a whole book, uh, which which we are getting also translated into Hindi. Uh, they have written Swaminath and people like that. And there have been art critics who have written very illuminatingly. So we are giving you another book published with our support called The Art Critic by Richard Bartholomew, <laughs> uh, who, who was considered to be one of the best on the moderns. It's, it's again a tome because nothing of his was published in his lifetime. Now this is a three-phase workshop. Rupa Rupa. <coughs> One is the intensive workshop like this. After that, we'll have paper presentation of all selected participants on abstraction in painting, sculpture, photography, music, dance, architecture, cinema. And then we will again try to look at the scene as presented by this. Choose papers and maybe publish them if they are enough in a book or if they are not enough perhaps in our journal we bring out a journal a copy of which is also being given to you it's called a root and then if some of you come out with that sort of a uh, intensity and devotion and intelligence in that order then we may pick one or two of you to curate a show of young people. So this is, and this will be an annual thing. This is not something which will, you are the first uh, victims of our, uh, <laughs> our tirade. And the tirade is that we must have young people write about <laughs> art. There are not enough of them and who can write in a manner which is, which is, um, uh, and on why we are emphasizing on abstraction, there's a uh, reason behind it. And the reason is that's the more difficult thing to write about. You see, the figurative art or the non-abstract art, you have objects and things that you can describe, a window or a woman or a goat or a cow or whatever, uh, and, and sort of. But when it is abstraction, your imagination and your creativity are deeply challenged to write intelligently about it. So we are giving you uh, two issues. One of Take On magazine, mm -hmm. which is on, on the critic. There's an issue of Marg magazine on abstraction, which we again, Reza Foundation, supported. And we are giving you a Roop, a issue, a, a journal, and of course, now, before I conclude, I just want to read a couple of poems to you, which tell you, not directly, they are not written for art critics, and the poems, but they, they make some sense to what the art is all about. Ye aggeti kavita hai, sannate ka chham, no, naach. This is about, you know, nut hote the na, jo idhar se idhar rassi bandh ke, us pe naach te te, unke, उसको लेकर है एक तनी हुई रस्सी है जिस पर मैं नाचता हूं जिस तनी हुई रस्सी पर मैं नाचता हूं वो दो खंभों के बीच है रस्सी पर मैं जो नाचता हूं वो एक खंबे से दूसरे खंबे तक का नाच है दो खंभों के बीच जिस तनी हुई रस्सी पर मैं नाचता हूं उस पर तीखी रोशनी पड़ती है जिसमें लोग मेरा नाच देखते हैं न मुझे देखते हैं जो नाचता है न रस्सी को जिस पर मैं नाचता हूँ न ना खंभों को जिस पर रस्सी तनी है न रोशनी को ही जिसमें नाच दिखता है लोग सिर्फ नाच देखते हैं पर मैं जो नाचता हूँ जो जिस हद रस्सी पर नाचता हूँ जो जिन खंभों के बीच है जिस पर जो रोशनी पड़ती है उस रोशनी में उन खंभों के बीच उस रस्सी पर असल में मैं नाचता नहीं हूँ मैं केवल उस खंभे से इस खंभे तक दौड़ता हूं कि इस या उस खंभे से रस्सी खोल दूं 
कि तनाव चुके और ढील में मुझे छुट्टी हो जाए न तनाव ढीलता नहीं पर तनाव ढीलता नहीं और मैं इस खंभे से उस खंभे तक दौड़ता हूं पर तनाव वैसा बना ही रहता है सब कुछ वैसा ही बना रहता है वही मेरा नाच है जिसे सब देखते हैं मुझे नहीं रस्सी को नहीं खंभे नहीं रोशनी नहीं तनाव भी नहीं देखते हैं नाच सो यू सी वॉट गोज इन टू द एक्ट ऑफ आर्ट है Which, which is about really somebody, a woman cook, oh, but this is how art is. I mean, you are cooking something. मैंने पूछा क्या कर रही हो? मैंने पूछा क्या बना रही हो? उसने आँखों से कहा, धुआँ पहुँचते हुए कहा, मुझे क्या बनाना है? सब कुछ अपने आप बनता है. मैंने तो यही जाना है. कह दो, मुझे भगवान ने यही दिया है. मेरी सहानुभूति में हट था मैंने कहा कुछ तो बना रही हो या जाने दो न सही बना नहीं रही क्या कर रही हो वो बोली देख तो रहे हो छीलती हूँ नमक छिड़कती हूँ मसलती हूँ निचोड़ती हूँ कोड़ती हूँ फोड़ती हूँ फेंकती हूँ महीन बिनारती हूँ मसालों से सवारती हूँ देखची में पलटती हूँ बना कुछ नहीं रही बनता जो है यही सही है अपने आप बनता है पर मैं जो कर रही हूँ एक भारी पेंदे मगर छोटे मुख की देखची में सब कुछ झोंक रही हूँ दबा कर अटा रही हूँ सीझने दे रही हूँ मैं कुछ करती भी नहीं मैं काम सलटती हूँ मैं जो परोसी परोसूंगी जिनके आगे परोसूंगी उन्हें क्या पता है कि मैंने अपने साथ क्या किया है Now here are two poems which are take, ta- talking about and what happens how a person who is doing anything वो अपने को उसमें झोक देता है और फिर ये कहता है कि तो अपने आप हो गया ये art is is not something which is self generating वो स्वयं भू नहीं है मतलब वो पत्तियों की तरह नहीं कि आपने जाके तोड़ के पत्तियाँ you have to make it and yet in the making you will discover that uh, beyond the certain point it starts making itself and that you only become a, a kind of a instrument Ali Akbar Khan Ustad Ali Akbar Khan who was a very strong guy one time he said in an interview that I play a little while I play a little while then I play a little while and then I don't remember what is happening what is happening so, you see, this is how it is. There is a point where art takes over. So the artistic process also needs your sensitive attention and your alert attention. Art is a matter of alertness. It alerts your attention and it wants an alert attention to itself. Now I have done my work. Thank you very much for coming. We are also launching, we have already launched in Hindi a huge program of book publication. And these are two books which we have just. Abra Kya Cheez Hai, Hawa Kya Hai. This is a diary of Krishmal Dev Vaya. And Ghalib wrote a long poem on Banaras. Chirage Dair. Aur unhone usko Hindustan ka Kaaba ka hai. इमेजिन आज वो कहते तो उनको भी जेल में रखेंगे तो खैर वाइ वाइ सिटिंग दे ओके सो इट हैज बीन ट्रांसलेटेड इनटू हिंदी एंड बी पब्लिश दे आल्सो गोइंग टू पब्लिश लार्ज नंबर ऑफ आर्ट वर्क्स आर्ट बुक्स इन हिंदी इंक्लूडिंग गुलाम मोहम्मद शेख्स बुक ऑन निरखती नजर गुजराती में है उसका अनुवाद हम करा रहे हैं प्रभाकर कुल्टी की किताब है वगैरह सो दैट्स ऑल राइट नाउ वी हैव रिक्वेस्ट यू नो प्रोफेसर पारुल दबे कची शी इज अ वेरी वेल नोन एकेडमिक एंड समवन हु इज गोइंग टू वेरी गुड वर्क एट द स्कूल ऑफ आर्ट्स एंड एस्थेटिक्स इन इन जे एन यू विच इज अंडर Severe circumstances, <laughs> trying circumstances these days. 
but that's how it is. Uh, we are all under trying circumstances these days. Uh, but uh, Dr. Mukherjee. Thank you. Thank you, Shobhji. Uh, thank you, Reza Foundation. And it's very hard for me to match up to your rhetorical and your poetic uh, and oratorial kind of, you know, skill. Um, it's very interesting, I mean, your very rousing and inspiring introduction, you kind of touch upon some of the very important aspects of art practice and art writing. And I think the central thing which you uh, very subtly focused on was the idea of agency, you know. And that's something which uh, my talk will also kind of uh, relate with. And, um, and uh, now that I've heard that uh, you, the kind of uh, wonderful books you're going to get in that bag, I'm almost envying you. I wish I was on the other side of the table. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just a brief introduction about um, what I plan to talk on. And since, I mean, we have luxury of time, I'm told. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, so we we've have. got maybe more than an hour. <laughs> so what I plan to do is that this is fairly, my presentation is fairly long. Uh, I don't want it to be long and boring. Um, I don't want it to be predictable, <laughs> going by your previous experience of moderating other sessions. But uh, I would really want it to be a kind of a workshop presentation. And uh, I, I think, please feel free, is it okay? Feel yeah. free to intervene uh -huh. at any moment. Yeah, yeah. So we can turn it into a kind of a discussion, yeah. rather than just me speaking all the time. So I would really welcome that, make it more interactive. Okay, now the title um, which I have given it, it's called The Ethnographic Turn in Contemporary Art and Art Writing. And it's really very much part of my current research. And uh, regarding its connection with Raza, it's very, very completely connected. Let me be very honest. But I would start with a personal anecdote. Uh, the first time I met Raza was in 2001 and uh, that too I met him at a conference uh, which was held in Paris. It was organized by two French um, uh, anthropologists, Gilles Tarabou and um, Denis Vidal uh, with Kapati Guha Takrita from India, she was also one of the organizers. And the topic of the conference was the politics um, of authenticity in modern and contemporary Indian art. And there were two papers that evoked very sharp reaction from Raza, and he was sitting there in the first row. One paper was by Kajri Jain, who teaches in Toronto, and other paper was by myself. <laughs> now, Kajri Jain's paper was on um, popular visual culture, which is very much our area. And she was talking about calendar art, and I was watching Raza's reaction was, since he was sitting in the front row. Every time Kaji would show images on the screen, he would visibly wince. <laughs> it was as if it was physically hurting his aesthetic sensibility. <laughs> so it kind of went on pretty badly. And my paper I could understand because it was uh, connected with my PhD work. It was a critique of Ananda Kumara Swamis take on Shilpa Shastras, particularly his use of, his lens of transcendentalism, with which I had problems. So, so maybe it's a kind of a travesty for me to be talking about <laughs> this conference organized by Raza Foundation, but I must say that at the end of the day when we had chance to talk to Raza over wine, uh, we had a sense of where he's coming from, and I think, um, um, I think it set us, uh, like raise questions to ourselves about, or oh, is it to do with his own status as a diaspora artist who has kind of cherished certain Indic ideas, certain civilizational values, which he, you know, thinks very highly of, and those are the values which were getting critiqued, yeah. and he probably, you know, kind of did not um, consider them to be, you know, not very, uh, kind of going along with his own uh, ideology. So in place of high metaphysics and Sanskrit aesthetics or Margi tradition, these are the two terms which I'll be using constantly in this presentation, <coughs> Margi and this, and I find them very, very interesting. I'm going to shift my focus on the interrelationship between Margi and Desi, a concern which would have resonated as much with Swaminathan as with Raza. Very bad. 
and thereby I propose to explore um, a strand of contemporary Indian art and also art writing that, according to me, inaugurated the ethnographic turn in contemporary Indian art. So this uh, brings me to another story, and I really wish Gulam Sheikh was present. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, can we have the PowerPoint, please? Uh, we have the technology of it. Okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, I can perhaps start with my presentation. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a story which I'm narrating. Mm -hmm. So in 1985, um, when we were MA students, I, I don't think anyone was born here among the students. Uh, Pushpamala, um, Aisha Ibrahim, she is now based in Bangalore, and myself, we had uh, gone to Naya village in Madhapur, uh, West Bengal, as MA students of Faculty of Fine Arts. And the objective of this visit was to document the art and life of one of uh, the artists, local artist, Dukhasham Chitraka. Patua, who lived in this village which was around 80 or 90 um, miles from Calcutta. Now this documentation project was mentored by Ulam Sheikh who was heading the painting department then and um, I wish I, I, I would I mean, still call Baroda as India's first post colonial school in that sense, first post colonial art school. Its aim was to address the white gulf which existed between the artists who were you know, trained in an art school like Baroda and the kind of practice which was going on in, in villages. Um, so while uh, uh, we have submitted our textual and uh, photographic documentation uh, to the painting department, uh, but we later, these photographs got immersed in archival oblivion because we, all three of us got busy with our own, you know, work. After three decades, Pushpamala chances upon these negatives and she develops them and she sends them to me and when I saw them, it was like there was a real shock uh, which we all experienced and in this paper I am partly going to also address the, the, the notion of that affect. Why, why did it create that affect? When we look at ourselves, our own presence in that village our own photo documentation after three decades and suddenly certain things which made it seem quite disturbing. And now I need images. Okay. Um, no. Yeah, great. If you can maximize it. Lights. Ah, yeah, I can switch off the lights. It's too big. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think. You can see, right? Okay. We'll be talking about some of them in greater detail. Um, so there was this contrast between <coughs> the, the kind of the native artist, you can see Dukasham seated on the floor, and then his extended family. And uh, the anthropologists like Chayo, like me, Pushpamala, and, and Aisha, we, we can't see too clearly here. Uh, so the visual difference prompted Pushpamala to scribble on the back of one of these photographs, visiting anthropologists. She wrote that. It was meant to be a kind of a, <laughs> a joke. <laughs> a parody that I turned into a heuristic to stage a conversation between real anthropologists and us fake brown anthropologists. <laughs> So these photographs triggered a reflexive moment in us to see a possible connection between our ethnographic experience and our respective practices in the field of art history and art practice. Because as I said, later we all went to different directions. How does one revisit this past moment through memory and visual trace and engage with the questions of difference across various registers like the urban and rural divide, folk artist, urban artist divide, and so on. What does it mean to document folk art across different types of unevenness and also consider the impact this, this encounter had on Pushpamala's later project, Native uh, Women of India series. And my subsequent interest in this theoretical framework which I still engage with is performative mimesis. Can this remembered encounter be considered as an event to stage a larger question about 
nature of interaction between art history, contemporary art practice, visual anthropology and art writing. So these are broad questions that I'm throwing, throwing open. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, okay, you can barely hear, read it, but I'll, I'll explain. So this, this, my presentation is in three broad parts. In the first section, I attempt to stage a conversation, as I said, between art history and visual anthropology. Why a specific genre of group photography that every anthropologist's field of photography would entail, right? Now, this genre is further narrowed to group photographs in which the anthropologist is himself or herself present, mm. posing with the natives. Right? So that's the genre I'm going to focus on. Using the lens of visual anthropology and art history, my focus is on a close formalistic analysis of the group photographs to understand asymmetries between us and them. This is something which will constantly reappear, you know, this unevenness. Something which we are not aware at the time the photographs were taken, but only when we encountered them as recovered images after 30 years. And, and hence, um, when I looked at these photographs, I was constantly haunted by the figure of anthropologist. Right. The second section, it deals with a more recent moment in 2015, when the same artist, Dukhashan Chitrakar, by now an impoverished artist, aged artist, who was not even able to travel from village to village, you know, doing his occupation, earning money, he calls me up in need of commission. and. So when I actually told him excitedly that, you know, those old negatives have been discovered by Pushpamala, he also got very interest, interested and he said, okay, fine, why not I make a scroll based on my memory of the 1985 documentation visit. So I said, excellent idea, please go ahead, right? Now there's a third part. Here I relate these photographs with Pushpamala's emerging art practice and her foreign to photo performance. <coughs> And because it was around late 1990s that she moved towards this new medium of photo performance and she produced uh, her by now famous Native Women of India, in which she defashions appearance after a tribal Toda woman. How does exploration of the colonial archives in which she places herself as a native compare with these photographs and relate broadly with the ethnographic turn in contemporary art in India? And I, I think that's a very important turn which is happening. In, in contemporary art. And finally, this is kind of a tentative conclusion which I'll offer, which is a critique of a particular strand of post-colonial discourse that this allows full visibility to the internal other, a problem that continues to haunt even the most politically engaged art discourse in India. Okay, so now we're going to start with the first, next slide please, the first section, which I call seeing the genre of group photo photograph anthropologically, yeah. So I'm, here what I'm going to do is I'm going to take Pushmala's humorous scribble on the back of one of those photographs, visiting anthropologists, as a point of entry. Let me ask the following question. What were the conditions of that photographic moment of 1985 that prompted her to use this label, visiting anthropologists, within quotes of course? The four-card documentation project that we were part of was actually funded by the state cultural ministry at that time. And it was mentored by Gulam Sheikh, as you all know, eminent artist and art teacher, to address immense disparity between the life forward and art that was practiced in modern art school, as in faculty of fine arts, and art that was practiced in <coughs> by folk artists in their native villages. The project was conceptualized in two stages. So stage one, the artist gets invited, the folk artist gets invited to spend some period, like almost residency, at the Faculty of Fine Arts to uh, interact with the art artists who are getting the training. Stage two, artists, art historians, students of course, they go and visit the same artist and study their art in, in that context. So that was the whole point of that documentation trip. So when, um, so that the whole point of the second uh, move was that, which according to me kind of resonates with what anthropologists like Melinovsky would call a participant observation, right? Next slide, please. Yeah. 
Now compared to, now this is one important difference which I want to flag, is compared to countries in Latin America, where anthropology had a different status, it was enlisted as part of the nation building activity. In India, cultural nationalism preferred to invoke its Indic, Sanskrit based tradition that presided over the early phase of nationalism during the first quarter of the 20th century. Remember Vande Matram, and it was a very strategic decision to turn that into our you know, national anthem and so on. Folk and tribal art did play a crucial role in early nationalist art, for example, Jamni Roy. Mm -hmm as for instance, but quite often it worked as a source of appropriation of visual vocabulary by a male urban artist as a way to indigenize Western modernism. Seldom did the figure of the folk or tribal artist per se emerge as a legitimate maker of modern art. Much like the way women artists remain confined to margins of art history, whereas they had a prominent presence in the symbolic realm, example, allegorical figure of Bharat Pata. But during the same time, you had a lot of women artists who were consigned to the margins of art history. Next slide, please. Slide six, yeah, thanks. Now, it was during, uh, largely during the 1980s, when folk and tribal art began to gain recognition and turn into object of scholarly publication, which was a belated acknowledgement from the state since independence. At a time when India was attracting international attention through its cultural intervention in form of festivals of India. Remember, 80s, the full of festivals of India happening in different parts of Europe, where, uh, US. Folk and tribal art best captured its Indianness and became the hallmarks of national authenticity. In fact, with the establishment of Mark, Ma Mark magazine in 1946, which, in, which could be termed as India's first kind of one of India's first post-colonial art magazine, and it was set up by Mulk Rajanand, as you know, he had a strong socialist leanings. Folk and tribal art enjoyed almost as much visibility as the Mardi art, classical art. But the tension between the two categories, that is folk, tribal, and Indic classical, manifested in opposing terms like Mardi and Desi, which were first used in the modernist sense by Kumaraswamy in an essay, which is a very important essay, I think, mid 50s. Margi, Margi would be like a lot of uh, ways of describing it, but a uh, uh, short way of understanding it would be classical, mainstream. Is it Hindi word? Margi, Marg, Marg. Marg being? Marg, main, main road, main, mainstream. Margi. There are a lot of different uh, interpretation. Kumar Swami, in but his essay, he draws uh, its meaning from one of the Vedic texts, and he says that which led you to heaven, Swagya, would be Mahi. So classical, that which is supposed to lift you from this mundane level. Is that what is like high art that, that is? Yes, in a sense it maps or onto uh, low art and high low art. art yeah. And high. yeah, exactly. exactly. There is a kind of a, uh, asymmetry which is based on perhaps class, caste and so on. So the pedigree of these two terms, in fact, Kumaswami did not use it for the first time. It was also used in uh, 12th century music text, uh, Sangeet Nakkar and all, where it was more used to talk about different musical styles rather than to plot these hierarchies. From 1982, Desi entered an institutional frame with Swaminathan setting up of Bharat Bhavan. I think Ashokji played an important role in Bhopal. An art institute envisaged to bridge the gap uh, between the urban metropolitan art and folk and tribal art in the heart of the country. So, when Pushma Man and I got involved in the project of documentation in 1985, it was an extension of the Desi project, right? So to speak, which was funded by the Culture Ministry and under its patronage, Gulam Sheikh encouraged students to experience and address the hierarchy between the urban and the rural. Next slide, please. So after, okay, this is one of the photographs you can see. After lapse of three decades, when I revisited the documentation project through these photographs, a set of differences between us and them, encapsulated by the label visiting anthropologist, did produce an effect that warranted a close visual study. The lens of visiting anthropologist also allowed me to closely examine this distinction between us and them, 
not only in terms of skin color, which is why I use the term brown anthropologist in a very political sense, but also in terms of our urban clothing, urban chic, as you can see in our stands, our tourist-like activity, like posing, you know, while drinking coconut water and our tokas, local hats. So I'm just, you know, uh, signaling all those visual differences. <laughs> Next slide, please. The, again, the parody of visiting anthropologists led me to compare these photographs with those taken by real anthropologists. So here you can uh, recognize the famous Malinowski, who is um, uh, posing with the natives from uh, the New Guinea island. And uh, so how does one analyze composition using standard art historical tools of formal analysis, which I'm going to do. At this point, it may be possible to stage a dialogue between anthropology and art history and move into visual anthropology. As, actually, visual anthropology was a very important uh, term. And uh, because in terms of disciplinary rethinking of art history, I would say art history learned many of its political lessons from anthropology because anthropology actually really talks about the whole notion of different cultural and social political difference. Uh, so with the help of anthropology, art history, and the so-called new art history that we often refer to, it was able to redress its own disciplinary blind spots. But can art history also offer tool to anthropology to de deeper the reflexivity about self-representation of the anthropologist and ena enable it to get over its anxiety of the visual. For a long time, anthropology had this anxiety of the visual. I mean, the uh, visual has always been kind of marginalized, in, even by mainstream history, saying that, you know, these are all su supplementary information to the main discourse, which is always in words, you know, history. The true history is in, in discourse, verbal discourse, not visual. Now let us look at the visual genre of group photograph that anthropologist like Malinowski uh, takes. So he is posing with the natives. And here I'm going to apply standard art historical formal analysis to this. Uh, to me, it reminds me of almost uh, The Last Supper by Leonardo. You have Malinowski, almost rice like sitting in the center <laughs> with these uh, natives who are actually quite unused to uh, sitting posture. And you find that they are dangling their legs, almost mimicking mm -hmm. the dangling legs of the anthropologist. Okay. So it creates a very really interesting staccato pattern of legs, you know, black legs dangling with this one white leg in the center. And also notice the difference between his bald head stands out amidst the dense black hair of the native as You can't see all this because uh, the image is not very clear, but you can just take it from me here. Uh, next slide, please. Now, within the genre of group photograph, that included the anthropologist is the sub-genre of anthropologists posing with native children. So I found this sub-genre, you know, within the archive that anthropologists collect. There are often photographs of anthropologists posing with the native children. So that becomes a sub-genre. How different is this from the preceding one? So you see Malinowski is crouching on left hand side and uh, the native children are kind of uh, grouped together in a mass in the center and they're all been asked to pose uh, as if they're playing a game, right? So we can see there's a certain kind of staging which is happening um, in this photograph. So even if Malinowski, uh, and Malinowski was very, very, uh, he was one of the first anthropologists to be self-reflexive about methods used by anthropologists, right? So he, in his writings, he also talks about photography, how you should use photography, uh, and you should avoid vertical shots. And he always uh, expected his photographer, as taken by his friend, to go in for horizontal shot, so that he felt that somehow it's going to diminish the hierarchy between himself and the and the natives by by the choice of that horizontal axis. But my reading is slightly different. Uh, even if Malinowski crouches on the left hand side to reduce the distance between him and children, the posture accentuates the stage aspect of his photograph rather than highlight his being a participant observer. Next slide, please. Now, uh, quite strikingly different is his contemporary Brazilian anthropologist, Ed Edgar Roque Pinto, in another part of the world, but also posing with native children. Here, native has a different resonance than in the context of Malinowski. He was, as a scientist, connected with, to the National Museum of Rio de Janeiro between 1905 and 1935. Pinto was involved in research on anthropology 
and ethnography of Brazil to describe the formative racial characteristics of the country within the context of Brazilian nationalist activism. So he's not seeing himself as the other in that sense. Pinto faces a camera which is held by his friend, Antonio Pyrenees de Souza, while holding the children in intimate embrace. As you can see, his both arms, they almost uh, create a kind of a spiral, S-like spiral, you know, left and right arm, uh, which kind of form a ring up around these two children. And uh, so Pinto shrinks the distance we noticed in Malinovsky's photograph by holding the children close to him, but is still at the center, acting as a pivot. What is striking is the manner in which the children are instructed to cover their lower parts of the body. This photograph aspect only occurred to me when I compared these photographs with the Midgapur photographs, right? Which we'll now see. Next, please. Before that, I just want to move closer home. These are photographs which I found from Vera, Vera Elvin's Elvin. album, where he, so there's a sub-genre also existing in his uh, photo album where he is posing with native children and uh, it's interesting because you, once you juxtapose two, for, they are two different photographs but you can have a sense of the genre. There's a certain order which both the photographs are facing, uh, are, are, are in, in hearing. So uh, he's sitting on the chair in the center, Elvin. He's surrounded by the local uh, children and there's one child who is made to pose in front so as to complete the circle. The next uh, slide, please. So, okay, now I'm going to come to our mimicking anthropologist photograph. So that's Pushpamala gazing at the scroll. That's me holding a, a child. And another one who is on the side, by the way. These photographs are part of Pushpamala's current artwork. And therefore, she's using black strips because there's a copyright regulation that you cannot use anybody's portrait unless you have a written permission from them. So I think that's the context of these black strips, which are extremely disturbing. Even when I was <laughs> analyzing them for my own research, I found them extremely disturbing. Okay, so in this photo taken by Aisha Abraham, she is a photographer, where Pushpamala and I pose with Patwa children, the gender dimension of the brown anthropologist obviously enters, enters the frame. So squatting on the floor and resting our backs against the mud-patched hut, Pushpamala and I examine the, examine the scroll held by open by her. So while she obviously strikes a pose while intently gazing at the scroll, I glance at it while holding the attention of a child on my lap with a camera cap. So I'm trying to divert his attention. The awkward posture of the bystander child on one side appears to be more of a happy coincidence captured by Aisha's, Aisha's camera rather than a deliberate pose. My hand accidentally covers the seated child's lower part of the body, so it's hard to tell if he had any covering. But the standing boy gets captured as naked. It is this easy inclusion of the naked infant that led me to pay attention to the careful orchestration of the little hands of children in the Pinto photograph, if you notice, you know, which betrayed an anxiety over this issue. But the sight of naked little children causes neither discomfort nor embarrassment, being part of what one expects to see in an Indian village. Next slide, please. Next slide, uh -huh, thanks. In this book, group photograph, again those black strips are very disturbing, the two genres combine, that is genre of uh, the anthropologist posing with the natives and anthropologist posing with children, right? And here the mimicking anthropologist quite easily blend with Dukisham and his extended family. And uh, you have, even in this extended frame, you have naked infants abound, but it's largely men who choose to hold uh, they are very proudly holding children while posing for the photograph, right? Notably, Dukusham Chitrakar is there holding uh, on the upper uh, middle corner, uh, who is holding his son Rohin, all grown up now, propped on his waist. Uh, so while men proudly pose with their children, women stand unencumbered, but they have their heads covered in a sari, a feature that will inform Pushumala's self-fashioning as a native woman a decade and a half later. Okay. What creates a sharp distinction between us and them are the black strips, of course, covering the eyes of the family members, whereas Kushumala and I gaze back at the camera. How does one define the gaze of brown ethnographers? So does our gender make it possible to conceive of category of a soft gaze? See, the, these are just questions which I'm just throwing open. Are the women who are standing there 
with the hair covered uh, impacting Pushpamala's gaze or will they reappear in her Native Women series when she refashions her body to mimic them? Okay, so now we move to the second section. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so now this is Sukhashyam returning his gaze back through the part which he makes in, sorry, it's 2015. He makes it and uh, he sends it to me. And where he is recording the 1985 documentation visit. And next, next slide, please. Okay, uh, I wanted you to see this very carefully. Um, so I just described the, the slide. So the first slide on the left hand side has Ghulam Sheikh, who is shown as a peer, as a Muslim peer with his mustache and beard. And three of us are standing behind him, and he's shown busy painting his his painting in, front, in the foreground. And three of us, one in the middle, I think Pushumal is holding a camera. Dukhusham shows Pushpamala holding a camera mm -hmm. just behind Sheikh and on the extreme right hand side three of us all, all dressed in our urban clothing uh, notice the trousers mm -hmm. and we are about to set out <laughs> on our documentation trip in that train. Next one please. Do you hear even what brown usually uh, fair for them? No, so I'm, I'm using brown as a political category. It's over not the way she paint, he painted it. Yeah. He did not paint you brown. But over here, I think it will come. It will come up again. Oh, so I'm sorry. So that keeps fluctuating. Uh, okay. Ma'am? <coughs> yeah. Uh, what are the photographs that you took with the kids? Uh, are they staged or is it candid? Well, it's. it's mm -hmm. I don't know whether they're staged, but they're, I would take them as early art photography because they are, some of them are taken by Aisha Abraham. Mm -hmm. And if you know Aisha Abraham's current work, they are, it's very much to do with family albums, right? Mm -hmm. So it would not be right for me to call them either way. I mean, one has to accept the fact that these are photographs taken by arts train, art school trained students. Mm -hmm. So they are in between, I would say, art photography. So they are in that sense, of course, posed. Mm -hmm. Certainly posed. They are not candid in that sense. But did you have any hierarchy in mind or anything like that when those pictures were taken? Like, you know, the kid is there and obviously you were not probably aware of all that or was it there in your mind? You know, you should take a thing, picture more with than hierarchy, should take a picture. Yeah, more than hierarchy, we, we uh, were a bit uncomfortable by the fact that we were such a spectacle. Hmm. So wherever we would go, we would have a crowd of people following us. In the morning, we would be going to the port Pukur to have a morning bath. And of course, that was one of the memories which have stayed. And for us, the whole idea of you, you are dealing with a place where there's no idea of privacy and all that. So of course, it brought its own whatever. Yeah. But uh, there was always that, that feeling of being the uh, object of curiosity was there. And it would be wrong for me to say that obviously there were certain hierarchies mm -hmm. which were there. But remember, we were all these students there, yeah. so it, were, it would have a different kind of power oh. asymmetry. So this is second set, uh, yeah, this is part of the same scroll. And this is Dukhashyam showing us. And remember, the skin color would keep fluctuating here. So it's us in a city. This is kind of life he imagines us to be a part of, right? And um, yeah, so we are constantly negotiating with this difficult traffic. Today, today's terms you can see it in terms of air pollution. I can, I can, I'm struck by those dark clouds which are coming out from the airplane <laughs> and so on. Yeah, next. Okay, now this is uh, Dukhashyam showing me as a JMU professor <laughs> who is teaching, uh, taking a class. But what is interesting is, unfortunately you can't see it, on the blackboard he has written, not in Bangla, but in English and in Hindi, what is Katha? So he wants me to take a class on, on the history of Potter painting mm. and something which he feels has not been done enough and thereby he's reversing his critical gaze back at us mm. and that makes me rethink on the early 85 moment and to ask myself what did it achieve, mm. right? So one is almost getting chastised mm. by the folk artist. Yes. You see? And this is where I raise the question of agency of the artist. Um, obviously, once I say, I use the term reversing the gaze, it's a very problematic term, I understand. 
because gays can only be reversed from position of some relative power, right? But despite of that, he is he understands that as far as his artistic agency is concerned, there that he's he's gone garnering the power to reverse the gaze. And he's reversing the gaze within the terms of his representation. And look at his um, uh, ingenuity. He is not that much even moving away from the language of butter painting. He's within that he's able to accommodate. This theme is actually the absolutely, uh, as far as butter uh, language is concerned, it's totally outlandish. It's, yeah. And yet he's able to kind of trope it to be able to accommodate um, an experience which traditionally they're not supposed to use this language for. Yeah. <coughs> so why he only imagine a uh, certain genre? Only and that is interesting. He's imagining the whole class to be full of women students. And I have a feeling even if you look at the way in which he's imagined the classroom, he, I have a feeling that I'm sure he must have seen classrooms in his village. Mm. So the school classroom then becomes a model mm. for him to understand yes. what JNU classroom must be looking like, right? This is perhaps what your vice chancellor wants you to look like, no? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, full attendance. Full <laughs> <laughs> attendance, no space for maneuver. But what he doesn't want me to teach, I certainly is not interested in butter painting. He wants me to teach them engineering. Uh. <laughs> that is his latest uh, obsession. Okay. So, okay. can we move to the next one? Yeah, this is the last concluding uh, panel of the scroll, same scroll, and so oh, this is, luckily we've got it in a good dimension. Thank you. Um, now I leave it up to you. You please uh, help me to decode this conclusion of Buddha Krishnam's part. I don't need to tell you who the person in red is. <laughs> we've returned back to the painting department. It's Gulam Sheikh. Yeah, Gulam Sheikh. Yes. And then one is gone different ways. Blue one is Pushpamala, yes, yes. Please, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Huh? I, uh, that is yeah. That is Pushpamala's work. <laughs> yeah, that's what it's like. <laughs> this is. Uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, probably he's showing me in white, constantly showing me in white. Okay, and it's interesting because I, since I am the patron, he's somehow putting a lot of focus on me, and this is something which, of course, I have to constantly remind myself. Like you know, this is a problem with uh, being a benefactor, and this is something sometimes, of course, this can be. Phantom lady, phantom lady. I, I, I should have asked him. Maybe I can still ask him. Yes, but it's like phantom lady pose. Maybe I should ask him because I thought that he. Because three women students have come from Faculty of Fine Arts, he imagines this place to be full of women and therefore he has got two guards on the side of the entrance who are women who are no holding guards. <laughs> That's one way of looking at it. But what is very interesting for me is the way I am showing Gulam Sheikh the photographic documentation in form of a pata. And look at the way he is showing photographs in terms of the same image which is repeated. Mm -hmm. So that's his way of showing this is not a part, it's a photograph. Right? So this, this, through this, I mean, I, I also use what I understand as performative mimesis to explain this mode of representation. When is it ended this? Uh, this is uh, uh, 2015. So he's also, just as we are having to depend on our memory, to remember our previous experience. He is likewise doing the same thing. Hmm. So does it also say that he's, it's not the Pat Chitra that you brought back, but you brought back your own experience and which is captured in the photographs. And uh, that's what he's telling you that is it? 
what have you got back and why aren't you teaching <laughs> that's not <laughs> so obvious here yeah. but yeah. Yeah. i think if you relate it with the previous one huh. that perhaps yes this is part of this can be part of a reading also one more thing which i see is that the, he is differentiating between you and uh, himself or his community in two levels like one level is that you are you are uh, coming from uh, a different background and second thing is that you are a woman i think that is also the difference because the way he is showing gulam mohammed shape mm -hmm. and the way he is portraying uh, women like uh, you women three of you two two, two of you uh, it's very three, different three of, us. three of you so it's very different because he is showing a kind of dif he is differentiating himself with the women but not probably with mm -hmm. gulam shake so because you know uh, he already has a model of showing um, artist i mean or very often in his patta painting he would show dukasha as an artist mm -hmm. so he already has a model all he has to do is of course add his right. fashion whatever to turn it into gulam sheik but uh, in the case of us i think is how to tweak the stylish so language uh, But that's also interesting that he's painting you in white and the fact that he constantly, <laughs> and which is also happens uh, in uh, art where the benefactor always gets some role and somewhere in the. In well, the thing. interesting because my JNU that uh, teachings uh, that that uh, screen yeah. they also show, he shows me very white. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah. So this is uh, I think end of our second section. and now we move to the final section um yeah okay so i'm referring to sonal kullar's book uh, which came out came out quite recently <laughs> and in that book um in fact she is the first art historian to draw attention to this encounter of ours with the bengali folk artists in fact one of the photographs that i'm discussing they are also used by her in the book right um, and she does it in the context of indian borders worldly and regional affiliation so she is using it in in a different sense however she refers to this moment as an example of in her words translation between local and regional cultures that was a hallmark of modernism in india the whole thing is very different it's a macro take because she is trying to address her book largely i mean to the western world as well not just indian uh, south asian world by saying that not at all moments that uh, we modern indian artists were turning towards euro american art world but there was a very healthy interaction between these artists and different regions so in that context she uses that, the photograph Yeah, uh, uh, it's okay. Uh, so yeah, this is the third section, right? Um, so before I turn to this section, let me just finish uh, what I have to say about Dukasha. So Dukasha would acquire a certain visibility in the Baroda art world. Remember, remember, he was invited on a residency program during the 1980s, being on a residency program, now languishes in oblivion and struggling to find buyers for his stones. The Desi artist, once a symbol or token of post-colonial democratic cultural politics, is now pushed to the fringes of contemporary art world. So when Kushmaya rediscovered the old photographs of her 1985 trip and sent them to me, what seemed like a simple documentation project, which was pushed to the corners of our memory, took another sense. Gulam Sheikh wanted us to live with the Patwas. and their families to connect their life with their with their work what then appeared like an organic community in a village then today appears like a community left behind dukasham subtle critique also alludes to the failed promise made to the rural artist not only by the state but also the very documentation project that we were once part of So, despite immense research which has been done on Patwa painting and institutionalization of museums like Guru Sadar Museum in Kolkata, um, cities and urban institutional sites hold the key to their visibility in the world. So, if, if I refer to uh, Tapuri's ex excellent work on Durga Puja, it is during Durga Puja that some of them make it to the city and find patronage. 
their relationship to the city is unidirectional. And so in that respect, our presence in the village was such a spectacle because it was a rare event, right? So that again flags for us the basic asymmetry between the village artist and uh, urban artist. Now this is the third section, and here I really talk about the ethnographic turn in both uh, contemporary art, and I'll briefly also touch upon art writing. And I'm going to focus on Pushamala's later works. Uh, but before that, there's one, yeah, can you next slide please? There's one, yeah, this is uh, Nancy's more recent work on Nojot Altaf, and uh, you can't read the quotation, but I'm going to read it here. Uh, from her, her book, uh, Nancy writes, I remember that morning in Bastar vividly. I had woken up in a green haze. Shantibai had collected the intoxicating mahua flowers that had fallen on the ground and was laying them out to dry at the dialogue center. We had planned a trip to Chitrakut Falls. Before motoring down in the falls, we had walked through the clearing of gorgeous sal trees the air ringing suddenly with the laughter of children jumping up to cradle themselves in a tangle of vines. So it's interesting, there's also reference of, to children here. And to me, this completely uh, resonates with this, what I understand as the ethnographic kind of art writing. So you have ethnography, the anthropological gaze, entering into the style of an art writer or curator like Nancy and Eugenia. So I find, I find very curious about this, this, this turn. And therefore, I start this section with that uh, quotation. Okay, um, so a decade and a half actually elapsed after our documentation <coughs> trip. So there's a gap of almost 15 years between uh, our visit and Pushpamala's Native Women series, right? So in this section, I want to explore a possible connection between the 85 moment and Pushpamala's Native Women series which I take to be aligned with the ethnographic turn in contemporary art in India. I think Navjot, Altaf and Pushumala's work then become kind of important, uh, you know, signposts. It was a Bombay-based artist, Navjot Altaf, who had pioneered a move in this direction by the late 1990s, when she had, in Nancy's words, surprised many of her contemporaries in the Indian art world by walking away from a successful career in Bombay and retreating to Bastar in the tribal heartland of Central India, unquote. Next slide, please. Okay, you already, you already on the next slide. That's fine. Now, until the 1990s, the discourse on modern Indian art was largely driven by the continual pull and push between tradition and modernity. Hita Kapoor captures the dynamics of the Indian modern under the lens of Nehruvian modernity by creating this quadripartite equation among nationalism, secularism, tradition, and modernity. Uh, I mean, I'm sure if she was here, she would not like the way I'm <laughs> talking about her work in this schematic term, but I mean, I'm just, this is a, my favorite quotation from the book uh, where she talks about nationalism um, and, its, and its relationship to um, modernism. She said, nationalism in experience is at the least a foil to the universal modern. It helps resist imperial hegemony up to a point a testing ground for an unheeding modernism. Likewise, modernism acts as a check against nationalism, nationalism's totalizing impulse through its celebration of transgression. Okay, so the temporality implied in the very title of this book, When Was Modernism, exploded around 1990s. Just as a construct of post-colonial discourse that pitted the Indian modern against the West began to sound increasingly out of touch with the times. This construct left little room to address the internal colonization that was underway following independence in 1947. After half a century of post-colonial era, the terrain of contemporary Indian art had grown far more complex with the impact of globalization on one hand and the rise of communal, caste, gender politics on the other. The internal others found voices through the cracks that had set in their ruling model. While art historians and critics were still kind of really under the impact of this very complicated development, artists experimented boldly with new medium uh, and materiality, which served to not only upturn the standard notions of time and space, but even the very question of representation, which was at stake. Next slide, please. So the pedagogic vision of Gulam Sheikh 
was as if applied to contemporary art practice by both Altaf and Pushkumala in different ways. Intertwined with self-fashioning of the artist as ethnographer was disenchantment with the idea of history as progress, throwing open the question of archive and creative anachronism in dealing with the past. If Pushpamala revisited the colonial photo archives, which had object, objectified the tribal bodies, as you can see the figure on the right, Altaf moved on studio to Bastar and aspired for a collaboration with tribal artists. Therefore, ethnography and archive emerged as two key axes that undergirded the shift in contemporary art practice. Pushpamala's Native Women series combined both his concerns, that is, of artists as ethnographer and history as archive. I locate Pushpamala's foray into photo performance within these two conceptual markers. How does our exploration of the colonial archives, in which she places herself as a native, compare with these photos taken in 1985, in the midst of native men and women in West Bengal village? At a time when post-colonial discourse, remember 2000, that was a time where post-colonial discourse was at its peak. So at a time when post-colonial discourse was at its peak, Pushpamala revisits the colonial photo archives and found their representation of native women a suitable subject for fierce critique, as you can see here. I mean, remember, notice the, the checkered pattern at the back, which really alludes to the colonial anthropometric uh, ways in which they used to measure bodies of uh, you know, uh, native uh, men and women to form their own data <coughs> about uh, you know, Indian bodies. Perhaps the term that uh, best encapsulates a careful move to photo performance, according to me, is, perf photo, uh, is performative mimesis. I find that term very useful because photo, uh, performative mimesis entail a different mode of representation in which the artist literally stepped into the shoes of native women and prepared her body and persona to represent the other. In fact, she had to darken her skin color uh, to uh, appear as an authentic Tora woman. Here, mimicry shades into masquerade from being a mimicking anthropologist to an impersonator of a native woman, of course with a qualification of South Indian native, she drew her new mode of representation via the postmodern citationality from an already existing formal lexicon of colonial photography. There's a brilliant essay on this by Susie Tharu, which uh, I would just mention on the site. However, unlike the casual snapshot of earlier photographic moment, remember those photographs which had a casual snapshot kind of a look. Her ethnographic series, these are the result of carefully orchestrated misocene, moving beyond the formal differences. Now I wish to engage with the political implications of this self-fashioning, invoking Hal Foster's formulation of artist as ethnographer. The next slide, please. And I'll just uh, read out this quotation uh, from uh, Hal Foster's this brilliant article, our quotation from his article, Artist and Ethnographer. He writes, Art thus passed into the expanded field of culture that anthropology is thought to survey. So having witnessed the expansion of the field of contemporary art in India's uh, India post-1990s, there was no simple or celebratory return to that earlier photographic moment of 1985. So artist slash art historian as an ethnographer has a longer history in India than the Euro-American world, given its diverse demography and colonial interlude. In fact, the very career of the terms we alluded to, Desi Marghi, captures deep social and cultural disparities across class as well as caste. Hence, Hal Foster's tracing of the ethnographic turn in 1960s, so in this essay, his basically uh, focusing on Euro-American uh, art world, and he uh, gives it a periodization. So 1960s was that moment of the ethnographic turn in that world, in which he says the earlier Marxist uh, class-based model of avant-garde that gets displaced by the new, uh, the, the model of the cultural other, the subaltern, right? Um, which I think it's very useful for me, but it's not fully applicable uh, to the Indian context simply because uh, you know that if you go through the trajectory of Desi modern, uh, Desi and Margi uh, classification, then we had a much earlier engagement with these questions than I think uh, even Hal Foster. Uh, next slide. Yeah. However, what I 
uh, what I find very useful about Hal Foster's article is there are two warnings that he sounds that helps in developing a critique of Indian artist engagement with ethnography. Does the project of ethnographic self-fashioning, as you can see in Krishnamala's extreme right hand side, fall into the trap of the practice of philosophical narcissism? That's the question I would like to raise. That's a question I also raise to myself. It's not that I'm keeping myself away from the critique. It is a possibility that Pushumar's mode of photo performance work invites, as does our retrospective glancing at the earlier moment. Can you see a kind of a, you have uh, Pushumala dressed up as a native woman on the right hand side, and there's another, the native woman in the photograph on the left hand side. <laughs> see her head covered? Unfortunately, she has her eyes, no, on the left hand side. Light green, yes, yes, yes. She has her eyes covered, unfortunately. Okay. So perhaps it's by showing Pushpamala as the artist in the making, she's still the artist in the making in this photograph on the left, and by foregrounding the characters who would subsequently enter a repertoire, that this critique can be preempted. As for example, the native woman clad in a sari with the head covered in the on the left hand side, she's among the photographed, potentially an object of Pushpamala's future gaze. But at the moment, she's part of her own environment and she's gazing back at the photographer. Unfortunately, the black strip comes in the way. Pushpamala is not yet gazing for her. So if narcissism is a possible trap that Pushpamala potentially faces, Altaf confronts the possibility of ideological patronage of tribal and Adivasi artists that she collaborates with. So take as for instance, Nancy Adegenia's otherwise brilliant book on Navjot Altaf, which is titled, it's called Navjot Altaf, The 13th Place. Despite its evocative subtitle, the book remains subsumed by the logic of the monograph, right? Which I think is an inevitable fallout when the book project is commissioned by a private gallery. A monograph tends to place the author in a position of ideological patronage which challenges the aim of the artist like Altaf to commit herself to solidarity with the worker or tribal in a material practice. So when we juxtapose the careers of the Kushyam on one hand and those of Kushmal and Altaf on the other, it dramatizes very sharp divide between folk artists and contemporary artists in India, a matter that deeply concerned Gulam Sheikh, not only mid 1980s, I'm sure it concerns him now, but also the whole pressure of Swami Nathan. So at best, the bold moves by these urban artists to reach out to their social and cultural others have formed their political radicalism. Why these artists have successfully reinvented their own practice through the ethnographic turn, but it is a post-colonial theory that also needs reinvention, which rather than foregrounding, East-West encounters needs to be more responsive to the history of internal colonization. Despite the radicality and politics of inclusion that underpins Pushkumala's turning this photographic moment into contemporary artwork, so right now I think um, all the photographs which I've shown you with black strips, they're actually part of a current contemporary artwork, right, which, which is curated by Arshia Lukanwala in, in Mumbai. So, the neoliberal ideology seeps in through the copyright rules in photography that disallows the showing of the face of the photographed natives without permission. So each time you need a written from permission. The black strips covering the eyes of them may fulfill the ethical code, but visually they further enhance the symmetry of oppositions between them, almost anonymous members of community, and us, an urban elite artist and art historian. The last slide, please. Yes, but despite the unevenness of her relationship with Dukasham, it is a scroll rather than in the photograph that he returns again. So in, in one of the photographs I actually found, the original photograph sent by Pushmala, I actually found Dukasham uh, without the black strip. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so he, it, it is in the photograph in the scroll that then in the photograph that he returns the gaze with his clever inscription of Patakatha on the blackboard, written not in Bengali but in English and Hindi, languages more audible in the corridors of art world and maybe potential market. 
thereby he inscribed his desire to be in the contemporary. The stroll that I've commissioned ultimately became a site of a new pedagogic responsibility in the way Dukashyam threw the ball back into my court, so to speak, by inscribing Patakatha on the blackboard. What sort of an anthropology of art writing to fashion that will make this impertinence from a folk artist legible? Thank you. So it's kind of work in progress, I would say. <laughs> so any questions or any other form of discussion? We have time before we give you lunch. Or we may not. <laughs> you may not. <laughs> I, I would like to ask. Please. Yeah, please. Introduce yourself because uh, we have not introduced. I'm Anita. I'm sorry, I just walked in here. Anita Khaibalutra, and I'm a visual artist. Also, use the use uh, the mic. Uh, oh. I'm doing some scholarly research, and oh, that's I'm fine. Doing so, uh, I have done some scholarly research uh, on the tribal and uh, you know this whole uh, idea of me being a contemporary visual artist. Uh, so I found myself uh, actually visiting this whole uh, pantheon or trajectory through my inner experience and spiritual uh, 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 initiation and uh, so my whole thesis was that I was decoding my art and what was appearing in my visualization and then revisiting the <coughs> Uh, tantric or um, tribal metaphorical language. So it was very fascinating and I feel that what you said, so I'm just curious because this divide becomes wider and wider as you said with now the black thing and all that. So it's really uh, amazing that I didn't feel that because I was visiting Kamala Devi's art and uh, uh, I didn't know her but the forms were appearing before and then I decoded it. I was encouraged by my professor in Columbia University. So what uh, my question is that, you know, you mentioned Swaminathan's project. So I do relate uh, to that idea through uh, what I experienced and I'm still discovering. Would you just... Yeah, sure. Um... You see, the whole point of, uh, as far as I understand, Swaminathan's pro very radical project of setting up Bharat Bhavan and uh, that, that famous gallery, uh, where he really imagined that it was possible to use the same space where uh, the artists from the metropolitan art world uh, and artists from the folk and tribal uh, kind of context would be showing their artworks in the same space. An experiment which was carried out in Australia uh, between a uh, relationship was set up between uh, Aboriginal artists.